What's up, everybody? You're listening to Jeffrey Lyles. This is Lyles Movie Files. Uh, we've already talked about the Oscars with the regular crew, but I need an esteemed expert in all things film, so I decided to call my man up, Tim Gordon. Tim is the president of the Washington Area Film Critics Association, and we were talking about the Oscars, and I just decided, hey, let's talk about it on the show. So, Tim, how you doing, man? Man, I'm fantastic, brother. What about you? I can't complain yet. I don't have that good pizza like you're about to grub down on, but I'm, I'm making out all right. <laughs> I'm doing my thing, man, trying to represent Korean Korean chicken pizza and uh, penny pasta pizza. Very good. <laughs> so way back in December, uh, Wafka, we had our votes for our films of the year, and – it, to some degree, they lined up pretty closely with the Academy Award winners. Uh, we had the same Best Supporting Actor, Mahershala Ali, for Green Book. Best Supporting Actress, Regina King, if Beale Street could talk. And then there were a little bit of differences. Or actually, we had Best Director, too, Alfonso Cuaron for Roma. And then we had some discrepancies. We also had Best Foreign Language Film and Cinematography for Roma. Right. Production designer for Hannah Beachler and uh, for Black Panther. And we don't do best costume, but if we did, I'm having a really strong suspicion we would have gone with Ruth Carter for Black Panther as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the Academy Awards now, how do you think that the WAFC Awards played out, you know, after everybody got to see everything? Well, I tell people all the time, man, that the awards are a three part system, right? So it's all the film critic groups that go first. And then there's usually the Golden Globe, and there's that season, and then the final season is the Oscars within a season. So it's a season within a season. So I think part of what the Film Critics Association's jobs are is to set the temperature and kind of the expectations for what the award season is going to present. So Regina King was very popular, along with Merce Lally, uh during the critics critics. Uh, part of it, the uh, all the associations, the Golden Globes picked up the ball. They did the same thing. You had shows like the Critics' Choice Awards, the Screen Actors Guild, BAFTA, and all of these other shows all kind of follow suit. So by the time you get to the Oscars, the critics groups, which kind of set the table back in December or late November, have given given voters the options of what what films should be considered seriously. And I think, as a rule, we did a good job with that this year. And I think it's something we've done throughout our 16-year history of being kind of an of, of a harbinger for what's to come during award season. Absolutely, because we're we're definitely one of the groups to get out there early, if not the first ones to to put our awards out there, kind of taking risk and all. And so you see something like with us, we voted for the two leads of A Star Is Born. Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga as the best actor and actress. And somewhere along the end part of December, Rami Malek started getting all this momentum for Bohemian Rhapsody. He did indeed, man. And I think part of what happens, I thought Christian Bale had a really good shot, man, up mm -hmm. until about the last month, man, where um, Rami Malek came on in a major way. So I kind of understood that one. But mm -hmm. the Olivia Coleman when to me was a surprise because Glenn Close had done well with the Critics Association groups. Mm -hmm. She'd also won the Screen Actors Guild. She had won the Golden Globe. She'd won the Critics' Choice Award. So you thought hands down that she was the favorite going in, and she got upended by, excuse the pun, the star of the favorite, Olivia <laughs> Coleman. <laughs> so, so that was a, that was probably the night's biggest surprise, along with all of the uh, technical awards that Bohemian Rhapsody won because they wound up winning more Oscars than anybody else, which nobody saw coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the sound editing was a real surprise. It's like, it's, I, I understand why people got tripped up on it, but it was like just in the clip that they showed at the Academy Awards, it was like, well, they're just doing the sound of a, of a concert. But these other ones are so much more intricate with the sound levels that they're putting out there. I agree with you, man, but I think if you really think about it, it is a film about a group, and a group has to feature a lot of songs. That's not, a, that's not an excuse, but 
But there have been films in the past, like Straight Outta Compton, which I remember within the last two years, that did kind of <clears throat> dominate those sound sound categories mm-hmm. in that way. So, you know, I don't know, man. I think every year we're seeing different things with the Academy. I think Cheryl Poon Isaacs, over the course of the last four years, has done an amazing job of diversifying or trying to diversify the mostly all-white, older male body of the Academy. And I think you saw on Sunday night when you had seven people, seven African-Americans win Oscars, and then you also had Alfonso Colon, who won three by himself, that that's ten different categories where you've had either Mexican-Americans or African-Americans winning Oscars. So the diversity of the Oscars, was it was probably the most diverse Oscars that we've had in recent memory. Mm-hmm. And I think it kind of puts the punctuation mark on the great year that African-American filmmakers and storytellers had in 2018. So here's a question for you. This was the first time that the acting awards were won by a majority minority actors. Is this going to be like an, an oddity or is this something you hope and think that maybe will become more of a trend? Well, I think, honestly, Jeff, that it goes from year to year, right? We knew mm-hmm. coming into 2018 that people we like David DuVernay, Ryan Coogler, George Tillman, Steve McQueen, uh, Barry Jenkins had films coming out. Um, so when you have, and Spike Lee, I completely forgot, mm-hmm. when you have all these talented auteurs that are going to be helming films, it becomes very simple to understand or expect that there's a certain level of quality that you're going to get. Um, I think that storytelling, you know, and, and you heard me say earlier that every year has its own personality. Mm-hmm. I think uh, 2018 is going to be 2018. When you see the, when you start to see more talented directors emerge, because filmmaking in this level is a director's medium more so than anything else. We talk about the actors, man, but the actors are only good if you have wonderful screenplays and you have great directors who are able to mm-hmm. kind of like, sh- sh- you know, shepherd these stories from from paper to completion. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question, I think you will start to see you will continue to see more diverse voices. I can't promise you that what we saw last Sunday is going to become the norm as it relates to an annual year-to-year basis because it largely depends on what is out there and who's directing what. So last year we had a we had a bonanza of, of voices and storytellers. I'm not sure, looking at the 2019 calendar, if we are able to repeat that this year because a lot of these people that put movies out this year are not going to be putting movies out this next following year. Right. So we're going to have to depend on new, young, up to, uh, you know, new storytellers and find out which direction they're going to take us. I mean, mm-hmm. I have high hopes for Jordan Peele, who is coming off of an Oscar for Get Out, but right. he has us coming out. I know Spike Lee is going into production for a new film called The Five Bloods that he's shooting right now over in Vietnam or Thailand. And I'm not sure if that's a 2019 release or a 2020 release. I know Kugler doesn't have anything new because he's now writing Black Panther 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, Barry Jenkins is probably working on something new. So as it relates to what we saw this year, like I said, it, it largely depends on who the storytellers are going to be and who will emerge. Because, you know, just like Jordan Peele came out of nowhere two years ago, uh, with his debut script that kind of set the world on fire, you never know, man. I mean, it's it's all, and that's the fun of it, Jeff. That sometimes that unpredictability or that that mystery kind of is what fuels the game. You know, who we may be talking about somebody a year from now that that none, neither of us know is coming, but they mm-hmm. have some work out, and we're gonna be like, woo, ooh, that was good. <laughs> yeah, because we definitely weren't talking about Jordan Peele three or four years ago when we were thinking like, oh, man, this is going to be a cool movie. He's doing Get Out. It wasn't like that with us. And it just was like, whoa, you can do this. And now we're really anticipating us like that is circled on my calendar. Like, can't wait to see that one. Don't need to see another trailer. Oh, yeah, man, I agree. It looks really good, yeah. man. And um, I'm trying to see. Um, I don't I don't really know, man. I haven't I haven't really studied the the calendar for 2019 because I have my hands in so much other stuff, but mm-hmm. I'm positive that something's coming down the pike that is going to catch us all by surprise. It always does. 
Yeah, it does. Now, I don't know if you were listening or paying close attention like I was, but during the show, you could kind of tell who was going to win because the the award winner got the loudest applause when they were naming off the nominees. And that just kind of kept proving to be the case. Like, okay, Olivia Coleman got the biggest applause. She's going to win Best Actress. There she goes. Uh, Ruth Carter got the biggest applause. Black Panther is going to take that one. But when Green Book started winning awards, the audience was a lot more muted. And it was this feeling like, I don't know, it was the, that weird thing where like some people don't want to say they voted for Trump. And it just kind of like, oh, Green Book won. And it wasn't that, yay, Green Book won. Cool. And especially during the Best Picture um, award, it was very quiet. I mean, you could, it was like you could hear the, the, the Green Book people because it wasn't like, yes, that was the best film and I'm so glad it won. What do you think about Green Book's success at the Oscars? And why was it such a controversial winner? Well, you got to remember, man, Green Book, when it first um, premiered at a film festival back in October, you know, everybody thought it was a crowd pleaser, man. It was a film that people kind of really enjoyed. It got a lot of, I mean, I saw it out in Middleburg, and it got a lot of love, man, out there. But then myself and other people started to take a step back and think about what this film actually was, right? And Mm -hmm. I, I think it comes across as being very tone deaf. So you think about a year where you have Black Panther, Black Klansman, you have uh, Hate the Hate You Give, and so many other storytellers who are African American, and to have a story primarily about an African American who is told through the eyes of a non-African American character. Um, in addition to that, it's kind of you know, and, and I know people kept making the analogies to driving Miss Daisy, and it kind of feels like a throwback to that. But I think part of, you know, the other issue was that the controversy that came out of the film where you had uh, Mahershala Ali, you know, uttering the N-word at a talk back. You had no, Vigo. Ali. Vigo. No, I'm sorry. I'm Vigo Mortensen. I apologize. Doing, yeah. Not, not, yeah, Vigo, I apologize. <laughs> Vigo Mortensen. <laughs> Ooh, dude, I apologize, Mahershala. You didn't do it. <laughs> Mahershala uh, having to apologize to the family who uh, called the film a symphony of lies and you know, um, the Peter Fairley, uh, you know, situation coming out about how he flashed, uh, you know, he flashed people on the set 20 mm-hmm. years ago doing making of something about Mary. So it mm-hmm. started to get controversy after controversy. But as a colleague of mine shared with me, part of like the conversation we're having right now, we as in critics and people of color kept Green Book alive and kept it trending because everybody kept writing think pieces and people wanted to comment on what this film was or what it wasn't. And that I think we have a a certain level of responsibility that we help keep that movie in the conversation, which in turn helped make it a best picture winner this year, instead of a film that was almost DOA with all these controversies in mid December. Mm -hmm. So it's funny in a, in a, in a very reverse way, I think what we, what we tried to do, all of us, by talking about what the film wasn't, kept the film, <laughs> kept the film afloat and kept mm-hmm. it in the conversation long enough for, for people to go, okay, well, yeah, I mean, looking at all the choices, it was the, it was the safe choice to win mm-hmm. this year. It wasn't Roma because Roma was, Roma was going to win foreign language. Mm-hmm. The Academy has never done a double where they've given a foreign language winner best picture. Right. Black Panther was very popular, but, 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 you know, it was a film that was widely celebrated. Um, but, but, you know, it was never filmed that I honestly believed or considered that people would vote for, uh, mm-hmm. not that Academy. Right. Um, right, right. I thought Black <laughs> Klansman was too controversial. Uh, I thought the favorite didn't have enough, uh, enough recognition as it relates to like not enough people saw the favorite. Uh, that would that, or thought it was a film that would carry the banner best picture, Bohemian mm-hmm. Rhapsody. No, so I mean, if you really look at it, Green Book is actually the safe choice, even though it's obviously not the best picture of the year. It's mm-hmm. the film that probably is the one that makes the most sense for the rank and file older Academy members to really get behind. All right, so I got two questions for you. If you could think back to all the films you watched last year, 
what would you swap out as a best picture nominee that was a better choice that probably should have won if uh you know and you can keep most of those films just take one one of those films out and what would you replace it with that would have a good chance of winning best picture i would have taken out bohemian rhapsody and you could have been you could have had any number of movies man you could have put in the hate you give you could have been in Beale Street and Talk. You could have put in uh, First Reform, the Ethan Hawke film. I mean, you, there were a number of movies, man, that could have got that spot. And you got to remember, Jeff, the Academy, since they changed the rules in 2009, mm-hmm. to go to 10 nominees have always right. gone nine. This yeah. is the first year they went eight. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Beale Street should have absolutely been a nominee this year. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no question. Um, but, yeah, man, I mean, it's the politics of it all, man. And, um, you know, um, I, I, I know members of the Academy, voting members, but, you know, they don't reveal their secrets, man. I think it's, <laughs> I don't think they can. So we are just left to wonder, you know, kind of why the why and what the percentage is. I don't know what the percentage is. They, they told us this year that there's a certain kind of base level percentage that you have to have in order to be one of the, the nine nominees. And they only got eight films that made that percentage which, again, they don't tell us what it is. Mm-hmm. So we're left to wonder, and it's like, eh, you know, what can you do, bro? But it's the politics of it all, man. All right. So, you know, I, I was talking to, to my buddies, and we were saying, like, you know, I, I couldn't be a Grammy voter because I couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't even vote in, like, a best hip-hop rap category because I would listen to current-day stuff and go, yeah, this isn't good rap. Now I feel like maybe, hear me out on this. It, should the should the academy have a voting age limit? Like you know, I I would imagine not a lot of sixty seventy year olds are going to vote for a Black Panther as best picture. So what do you think? Is right. there a cutoff that should be like you can still be a member, but your vote is more like an honorary vote, not necessarily going to count in the in the grand scheme of things. Well, well, that's a good point. I never thought of it from an age level because I think expertise is expertise. I think my biggest issue, if I had to change anything about the Oscars, is I believe the Oscars should include a film critic category. Because Mm. if you really honestly think about it, everybody who's in the Academy, for the most part, are all working professionals, right? Mm -hmm. So they're not getting the chance to see, uh, you know, like let's say Regina King, for instance, right, as an actress. How many movies do you think Regina King can watch in a year in between all of working on her movies, uh-huh. working on TV television shows? shows? Yep. Huh. Let's say now, maybe 10. Tim, yeah, so Regina King might watch, watch, may watch, have the ability to watch 50 movies if she can get that in. Jeff Lyles might watch 200. Tim Gordon might watch 300, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I think, to me, I think that to me is the failing of the Academy that what people don't take into consideration is that there's so much stuff that people don't get a chance to see that it's not through negligence. It's through, you know, you work and you're, you're doing a thing. You don't have time to watch other people's stuff. <laughs> you, you concentrate, you got to, like for the director, for an example, how many movies do you think of Steven Spielberg gets a chance to watch in between trying to do Steven Spielberg movies or mm. Alfonso Cuarón? How many movies do you get a chance to watch? And I think I think this is an obvious question to me that always comes up every year at the Oscars when I hear these stories about, you know, people farming their movies out to their cousins and their maids. Watch this and let me know what's hot and get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's crazy, man. It's crazy. Yeah. No, and that is a very good point because it just seems like, like right in the start of it, they start tabbing stuff like Oscar contenders. Like a star is born from the moment it came out. Oh, this is going to be up in the Oscar discussion. And I feel like it's a case of the popular favorite films just carry through. And it's not necessarily that they're always the best films. Like I figure like Bohemian Rhapsody got a lot of buzz because probably a lot of Academy voters like Queen and like the songs. So I watch Queen. I watch their biopic, but maybe I won't watch a film like Widows because not enough people are talking about it. <clears throat> well, you got to remember, man, you heard me say earlier in this conversation. That is a three three tier strategy, right? Mm-hmm. So the first tier is the most important tier, which is the critics. The critics start getting together, you know, Washington D.C. area film critics, um, 
L.A., New York, Chicago, Boston, et cetera, and they start kind of laying the groundwork for the things that are hot, right? So um, I, I remember being told by somebody here locally at Ally, which is our PR agency, that studios don't really care which critics groups, you know, name this is their top film. They just want to have an accumulation, let's say, that 25 film critic groups thought Lady Gaga was the best actress or 30 groups thought that Black Klansman is hot. And then they take that and they use that as a marketing campaign and the grow voters who don't have enough time to watch all these movies go, oh, that's what the critics are doing, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then they start making decisions <laughs> because now they know what films they need to watch because they're seeing what the critics have voted on. Right. Then the Oscar voters are doing the same thing going, oh, those are the movies that the film mm-hmm. critics all thought were special, so I need to watch these performances. And there's so many other movies that if they don't get the, if they don't get the love from us, early in the season, those films may possibly never be watched later in the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting way it breaks down. So what are you mm-hmm. hoping to see in 2019, Tim? Man, more good movies, man, because like I said earlier, I haven't looked at a calendar. The only thing I know that's coming out for sure that has any merit is that uh, we're going to be ending Marvel's huge phase with uh, Captain Marvel and Endgame, and I think there's a Spider-Man movie coming out that's part yep. two this summer. Uh-huh. So we know they figure out a way to bring Spider-Man back from <laughs> Thanos' uh, finger snap. <laughs> 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 so, hey, man, I'm looking forward to some good movies, man. I'm looking forward to being surprised this year. Um, I know Netflix, who literally spent millions trying to get Roma a Best Picture win, uh, now has if you thought you thought you saw stuff with Roma last year, you wait till you see the campaign they come up with later this year for the Irishman yeah. that's directed by Martin Scorsese, starring the, the heavyweights Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, Harvey Keitel, and Joe Pesci. Man, I, I expect uh, Pacino and De Niro to show up at my house, man, and be like, "Hey, man, Netflix sent me." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we want to watch the movie with you at your house. I'd be like, yeah, that's cool. I can vote for y'all. You got a problem with that? No, no, come on in. Want you some know, popcorn? I'm good. I'm good. All right. <laughs> then I, I whisper something under my breath and De Niro, so you talking to me? No, no, man, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's an exciting year. I'm looking forward to it. Like I always tell everybody, the Oscars kind of marks the reset button for the for the cinema year for all of us. And it's January and February. Man, absolutely. They're pretty low in terms of like the contenders. And, you know, we have a rare outlier like Black Panther that just kind of comes out of nowhere and still carries through. But now is when we start getting into the to the weeds. Like, okay, now it's time to start seeing good good movies here. Well, Tim, mm-hmm. thanks, man. I appreciate you calling in and talking about the the awards and the whole process of how this breaks down. So people aren't like, man, how did Green Book win? So yeah, that 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 provided a lot of that's good a, insight. That's exactly how it won. <laughs> <laughs> hey Tim, so where can but people no problem, track you Jeff, down? Man. Oh, definitely. Where can man, people they, track you down and follow your stuff? Man, I'm at Film Gordon on all through, on all social media platforms: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And if you want to hear me unshackled, unbridled, and unconquered. I'm on the big show, keeping it real with Phil Gordon. <laughs> Every Unshackled. Saturday morning, man, at 10, p- at 10 a.m. on DC Radio. So that's dcradio.gov, and they can check me out. Good deal. Hey, Tim, I will see you this week with Captain Marvel, my man. All right, man, you will indeed, bro. You take care, man. All right, you too. Thanks a lot. All right.